in the penultimate session of the Pondi Lit Fest, Dr. Minakshi Jain, historian, will talk to us on revisiting Ganga Jamni Tezib. Uh, namaskar everyone. Uh, I think I will be forced to take you back into history. Uh, to, uh, my topic is uh, Ganga Jamna or Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb. This is a phrase that became very well known in the mid 20th century. I don't know whether people south of the Vindhyas are aware of this phrase, but what it implies we are all aware of. Basically, it says that like the two rivers, Ganga and Jamna, the two communities, major communities of the subcontinent lived in absolute harmony, harmony and there was never any tension between them. Now, uh, when I start my uh, topic, I mean, when I start my talk, I just want to clarify that when I uh, examine this concept, I'm going to talk about the political and religious intellectual class and not about the masses. So, uh, uh, the first, I want to uh, make a couple of points because I have half an hour. Half an hour? Okay. Now, uh, the first point that I would like to make is that the Muslim political elite, throughout the period of its ascendancy, it maintained intimate contact with the wider Muslim world. And I want to give the examples that, you know, uh, for several centuries, the sultans of Delhi were ruling parts of North India and they regarded the caliph of Baghdad as the sole source of legitimacy. And, you know, uh, they would uh, wait to get letters from the caliph of Baghdad. In 1208, the caliphate was abolished. But the sultans of Delhi continued to pay homage and allegiance to a hypothetical caliph. So they, their coins bore the name of the caliph and homage to the caliph when the caliph was not even there. So that was the extent of identification with the wider world. And this uh, continued surprisingly under the Mughals. The Mughals maintained strong contacts with Central Asia and Iran. And they defined themselves first and foremost as Muslims who shared a common culture. And they said that we are descendants of Timur. You know, Timur invaded India in 1398. And all the Mughal emperors, they said that we are descendants of Timur and they took pride in their Timurid ancestry. Most of the Mughal emperors from Babur to Aurangzeb had not visited Central Asia, but they regarded Central Asia as their homeland. And they spent so much money in trying to reconquer parts of Central Asia, which proved to be such a financial drain on the resources of the Mughal Empire. But there was no emperor from Babur to Aurangzeb, who said we do not have any links with Central Asia. And they said that, you know, this is our homeland. And in fact, all the Mughal emperors, they sent men and money to keep up the Timurid mausoleum in Samarkand. And the uh, Taj that we talked so much about was actually modeled on Timur's mausoleum in Samarkand. So that is, that has left this identification with the wider Islamic world has led some scholars to say that the Muslim political elite in India was an intellectual, was an exotic breed. They were in India, but not of it. So that is uh, the first point. Uh, the second point that I would like to make is that, you know, uh, we hear so much about uh, the Mughal medieval period as a time of shared power between the local people and the Muslim rulers. But that is really not true. The Delhi Sultanate 
that was established in 1206 was at the outset, outset aggressively Muslim, exclusive and hostile to the participation of non-Muslims. In the first hundred years of Sultanate rule, only one Indian Muslim was admitted into the ruling class and he was executed for treason within one year. Now, this pattern of keeping out uh, non-Muslim from the political process, it continued under Babur. Uh, Babur came uh, from uh, outside and he brought two groups with him. One was the Central Asians that are called the Turanis and the other were the Iranis. So, this ruling class in India remained of Turanis and Iranis and that pattern continued under Humayun who was forced to leave India in exile and when he came back he brought more Iranis and Turanis. Now you know uh, we look upon Akbar as a period of great change uh, but uh, for uh, at least 15-20 years of his rule uh, Akbar did not include non-Muslims within the nobility. What forced him to change his mind was the constant revolts of the foreign nobility because they said, you know, this boy Akbar is only uh, 15, 16 and we come from more distinguished families and so we should be on the throne of Hindustan. So in 1580, there was a revolt of the foreign nobility which was so severe that Akbar was almost dethroned. That is when Akbar realized that now he has to adopt a different strategy. It's like two parts of a scale. So all the weight is on one side. He has to put something to counterbalance on the other side. And he was a very, very astute uh, thinker. And he thought, who are the people who I can bring into the ruling class who will not threaten my hegemony? And he identified two groups. One was the Indian Muslims because they were converts and no foreign Muslim was going to accept their leadership. And the other was the Rajputs. So these and no foreign Muslim was going to accept the leadership of a Rajput and revolt against Akbar. So under Akbar, 70% of the nobility or the ruling class remained foreign, that is Iranis and Turanis, and 30% were divided between Indian Muslims and Rajputs. That remained the pattern throughout uh, after 1580 under Akbar's time. Now, uh, what happened? Things became worse under the time of uh, Akbar's successors, Jahangir. You know, Jahangir did not appoint any Indian Rajput as a governor of any province after he dismissed Man Singh because Man Singh had supported his son in rebellion. So, in the time of Jahangir, we see a very pro-foreign uh, nobility policy being adopted. And in the time of Shah Jahan, the Turanis and Iranis remain ascendant. Now, uh, uh, just to give you an example of Shah Jahan, he appointed 13 heads of the military department during his reign. All were Iranis. So out of 13 heads of military department, not one that was appointed was a non-Iranian. He appointed 152 governors during his reign and only two were Rajputs. So, you know, the pattern, there is no evidence of genuine sharing of political power is any problem. Can you? Is this? Yeah. So, um, the, I hope people heard the other part. Yeah. So, this pattern remained uh, under Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb, uh, there was a slight change in situation because, you know, the revolts of the Marathas in the south uh, forced him to spend the last 25 years of his life over there. So, there was some change in the political representation. But Dominantly, it remained the same. And after Akbar Aurangzeb's death, again, we see the ascendancy of two groups. One is the Iranis, 
one is the Turanis. So when we talk about uh, the Mughal period being a period of Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, we have to counter this with facts because you know uh, all these uh, charges or all these things that are said. It's very important for us to take recourse to facts to understand what the actual situation was. Now, the third point that I want to make is on the Mughal policy towards language. Now, in this entire, entire medieval period, uh, there were two strands on the language issue that were at work. One was the strand that was dominated by Persian. That Persian ascendancy was confined to the courts and to the political elite. But outside the courts, there was a language that was naturally develop developing and that was Hindavi. And the beauty of Hindavi was that it took words from wherever it went. So it even borrowed a lot from Arabic and Persian. It was a free-flowing evolution of a language. Now, this uh, interaction between Hindavi and Arabic and Persian, it continued for 600 years. The problem began when the Mughal elite lost political power. When the Mughal elite lost political power, it was determined to retain its separate identity. The state power could no longer be used to keep the ascendancy of Persian intact. So the language of state should naturally have been Hindavi because that was the language that was evolving and that had incorporated words from everywhere. But the Muslim intellectual elite that was represented by the Naqshbandi Sufi order, they said we cannot accept this language because it's full of too many Sanskrit words. So, in the 18th century, a systematic process began by which Hindavi was stripped of, of all Sanskrit words and full of Arabic and Persian words. I'll just give you an example. Uh, in Hindavi, I would say, Main ye kare prathe karungi. But when this uh, process of purifying Hindavi and creating a new language, then it became so, you know, and it became more and more complex. So, uh, we have this situation where a Muslim language gets created out of a non-Muslim language in the 18th century. And this whole process of creating a new language is presided over by the Naqshbandi Sufi order. So, this is another point that we should uh, keep in mind. Now, uh, at this time, when the Mughal Empire is in decline, uh, the Naqshbandi Sufis and other Sufis are alarmed at the thought of political power falling into the hands of newly rising groups like the Maratha Six Jats. So, the first person who takes a stand against this is Shah Wali Ullah. Shah Wali Ullah writes letters to the Afghan ruler Ahmad Shah Abdali and says, you please come to India and protect your Muslim brothers because if you do not come, then you know you will no, no longer hear the call of Azan in, in this land. So, uh, Ahmad Shah Abdali uh, actually makes five or six uh, trips to India and that is when the process of outside intervention to stem the rise of the Marathas and six uh, uh, starts. Now, uh, before I get into this, I want to talk about what was the policy towards cultural symbols and architecture. So, I have first pointed out to you the limited nature of the political elite. I have also talked about the birth, birth of a new language. And the third point that I want to make is how uh, the Mughal elite made a conscious attempt to remove from public view the sacred strict structures of other communities. And uh, you all are aware of Shah Jahanabad. 
Shah Jahan Abad was the new capital city that was created on orders of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. Now, Shah Jahan Abad, uh, there is one side, the Red Fort, which was the residence of the emperor, and across the street, there was Chandni Chowk, where the entire Muslim, uh, the entire Hindu uh, business communities, they re resided and they had their shops. So, it is very surprising that when you go to Shah Jahan Abad, you will only see mosques. But the problem is that that area was being inhabited by the Hindu mercantile community. So why is it that you don't see? So Shah Jahan, when he uh, built Shah Jahan Abad, he gave orders that in every lane, by lane, high lane, there should only be Muslim architecture that should be seen. No other architecture should be visible. And even in an area like Katra Neel, which was predominantly a Hindu area, it had six or seven mosques and no temple that was visible. Now, you know, uh, uh, in uh, 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 in the early 20th century, when the British were still ruling over India, they did a census survey of the buildings that are there in Shah Jahan Abad. And the results of that survey were truly astounding. They found that in the period of Mughal heyday, that is from the time of Shah Jahan till Aurangzeb and a little beyond, that is from 1639 to 18, uh, you know, 1857. I mean, they said that, I'll just give, uh, revise the figures, from 1639 to 1739. That was the period of Mughal Hede, and they the census showed that one not one temple was built in Shah Jahan Abad during this period. So for hundred years, the Hindu business elite is living over there, but there is no temple that was found in a survey conducted in the British by the British in the early twentieth century. Then they said that. Uh, there were 15 temples which were built from 1739 to 1803. That is when the Mughals were no longer ascendant. And in the period of British heyday, British entered Delhi in 1801. So, in the number of temples that were built in the period of British heyday, there were 81. So, none during the period of Mughal power, 15 when the Mughals are in decline, and 81 when the British entered Delhi. Now, you know, they, they said, how can it be that the entire Hindu uh, commercial elite is living in over here? So, there has to be some story. It cannot be that the entire uh, Muslim, uh, the entire Hindu business community gave up worshipping temples. So, they did a house-to-house -house survey. And they found that the Havelis of these Hindu merchants, they had high walls. High walls as a security and also to ensure that nobody can from outside can peep in and see what is happening. And they were shocked to find that within the high boundary wall, in the inside of that wall, there were small openings in the boundary wall. You know, like you have alas in old houses where you put books or whatever. And those alas were where the Hindus were keeping their deities. They were not blowing conch shells. They were not ringing bells. From outside the wall, you would not know that inside the wall, there are these Hindu temples. So, uh, uh, you know, and uh, when the British started gaining ascendancy and the Muslim, uh, the fear of the Muslims uh, receded, there were some temples built in Delhi and two in the Shah Jahanabad area. But none of these temples had a shikhar because a shikhar was the identification that it was a mandir, so there was no uh, um, building that had a shikhar. So, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, Ganga, Jamni, Tehzeeb, uh, we'll talk about why we talk about it, but it is important to remember and recall the trauma and the sheer terror that uh, gripped large parts of the 
Hindu population, even people like merchants and businessmen. So, uh, this entire narrative that has been thrust down our throat at a particular point is something that we need to be aware that it is uh, a falsification of history. Now, when the Mughal Empire went into decline after the death of Aurangzeb, that was surprisingly the period which gave great impetus and hastened the hold of orthodoxy. So we have the hold of orthodoxy uh, becoming much more marked when the period of uh, the Mughal decline has come and the, uh, the Muslim religious leadership says that the Mughals went into de decline because they did not follow the pure path of Islam. And so a series of movements began in Muslim society that you are not to follow any custom that is being followed by the Hindus. So if women go to mausoleums, they are supposed to stop that. They are not supposed to take food from Hindus. They are not supposed to fast, fast as Hindi women did. So the very, very concentrated campaign begins. And this campaign, the leader of this campaign is Shah Wali Ullah. Shah Wali Ullah's father was the person who in the time of Aurangzeb prepared a compendium because you know the Muslims did not know. Is the time up? Yeah, I'll try to finish. So Shah Wali Ullah, he prepares a compendium that ordinary Muslims, you know, who's to guide them on what they're supposed to do, what they're not supposed to do. So he starts this movement and I told you that he uh, invited Ahmed Shah Abdali. So after Ahmed, uh, Shah Wali Ullah, a movement begins in Indian Islam called a tariq e muhammadiyah Now this tariq e muhammadiyah has uh, spreads all over North India and it says that we are supposed to follow pure Islam. And a whole lot of movements uh, begin in India. And I'll just give you one or two examples because I want to talk about what's happening in the Hindu community also. So, you know, the uh, very one important person is Sayyid Ahmad Shahid. Now, this Sayyid Ahmad Shahid, he leaves Delhi and he starts jihad. He goes to Balakot and he starts a jihad. Now, one would think that the jihad would be against the Hindu, the, against the British because they have replaced the uh, Muslim political leadership. But Sayyid Ahmad Shahid wages a jihad not against the British but against the Sikhs who are there in Punjab. So, he has an uh, you know, encounter with the Sikhs. He is killed in that encounter. And the kind of support that he gets from Muslims all over India is amazing. There were two people from Patna. They were called the Patna Caliphs. They were sending reinforcements by money and material from Patna to Balakot to continue the agitation against uh, the Sikhs. And after that, in Bengal, uh, a whole lot of movements start. You know, I um, there is uh, the Karamat Ali, he flow a, a sails a boat for 40 years so that he can access every interior and tell those people. And there are people like Titu Mir, uh, Dadu Mia, etc. Now, I just want to make two points. One is very important and that is Sayyid Ahmad Khan. We all uh, are told that Sayyid Ahmad Khan is one of the builders of modern India. But if you look at Sayyid Ahmad Khan's uh, political role, Sayyid Ahmad Khan was actually the founder. I don't think we need to use the word finder because that founder because that separatist mentality was always there. But in modern India, Sayyid Ahmad Khan was among the founders of Muslim separatism. And he tells the Muslims, please do not participate in the Indian National Congress. We are not going to uh, help the Hindus to come to power. And he tells the British that if you are going to introduce a representative government, 
you have to first of all deny the vote finished okay then i leave sayed ahmed khan uh we can discuss that later but while we are discussing uh the muslim thing what was happening within the hindu community in this period bengal is the harbinger of indian renaissance that bengal renaissance talks about reestablishing the ancient traditions in harmony with the modern spirit so on the one hand you have the muslims emphasizing separatism and on the other hand we have a bengal movement uh, which uh, you know has people like raj narayan basu and they write you know testaments for the hindus and we have people like so they organize they organize hindu melas and their attempt is to revive the ancient traditions and uh, institutions of the ancient period and revive them in a modern context and to bring about a regeneration of hindu society but the point is that they are also aware that it is important if we are going to move then we have to have some kind of rapprochement with the muslim community so there are many tracts that are written in bengal at this time and they say you know like even bankim and shri bindo wrote on bankim and he said bankim gave us the vision of our motherland so you know but bankim also says that you know if we have to move ahead we'll forget what has been done to us in the past and try to build bet- uh, between the two communities uh, so this is the point now if the two communities were going in totally different directions with the hindus trying to accommodate why is it that the uh, what was the reason for the change when the hindus started trying to really bend backwards to accommodate muslim sentiments and according to me the breaking point was the khilafat movement the khilafat movement had nothing to do with the hindus it was about the restoration of an institution which was not outside which was not in india it was outside india but the indian national congress uh, they said that we will work for the establishment of the khilafat and that is from that period i think that there was a that the hindus were forced to take a back seat and the confidence with which they had tried to revive their civilization suffered a back seat so i'll stop over here thank you